What's going on, everybody? I got a special guest today. I got Sergeant Major Archibald, United States Marine Corps, retired. He was my company first sergeant when I first came in the Marine Corps and checked into Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, way back in uh, 2002 time frame. And uh, he served a long, lustrous career in United States Marine Corps, and I'm um, glad to have him on today. So, uh, Sergeant Major Archibald, welcome with us. Thanks for, for the invite, and I appreciate the chance to have talk about that. All right, so uh, just kind of the basic format here. Um, you know, this this show is to highlight the individual warfighters, these guys that, you know, have enlisted, sw swore an oath, joined the U.S. military, you know, whatever branch it might be, and I uh, just want to highlight their careers and their experiences um, from joining, you know, from first joining, going down range, coming back, getting out, the whole nine yards. So uh, let's just take it from the top, you know, as a young man, when did you decide to join uh, the U.S. military, and then what made you decide to be a Marine? Uh, honestly, uh, um, my father was a Air Force uh, careerist as well. I'm kind of the, the nomad class of, of my generation where we moved from duty station um, from Massachusetts all the way to California. Um, and many it was always in the uh, in the blood of that kind of restlessness. Um, as a Marine, even though I, I recently did a lot of research on it, that I didn't join until, until I was the age of tried out. I went to, I was in Lubbock, Texas when I enlisted on October 23rd of 94. And before that, I had uh, done some, I didn't really like it, so I dropped out. And I needed something else because it was getting pretty tough times. This is at the start of Reagan's administration. And you see the the the, the cabal established Trump. Well, just, it, it hasn't changed, really. It's just a different version. But they did in the, it was getting tough times. And it was hard to find a job to, to really make ends meet. So they made it to, to uh, see the recruiter, went to the Air Force recruiter. And there was a big sign on the door. And I, I said, I, so I walked, started walking away, and uh, you're coming out. Hey, what's up? I said, I, I wanted to talk to the recruiter over here, but he, he's never around. I have something for you. This is Staff Sergeant Willie Nimmer. Still remember his name. Great guy. Bottom line is, I enlisted in October, went to boot camp in January of 1985. I was in platoon, was it 2009? Second. In recruit training battalion San Diego. I didn't finish as a honor graduate, but I was the guide on carrier graduation, uh, which was, I was pretty proud of that. Um, you know, I'll start somewhere, right? So off to the school, um, based on aptitude and everything else, you know, how they place you. I thought, well, okay, good. I get to play with some big, big guns. And instead, what I had is. Hello? Yeah, I, I got you. The audio cut out a little bit, but uh, you, you said you uh, were going to artillery? I signed to artillery, which was fire direction control. I didn't know what that was until I got to. But based on the math skills and everything else you had to go through. You know, the testing, uh, it was good enough to get in the direction MOS and started from there, which, of course, you have your basic fire direction and the unit, your battalion, as you know, you either go to a firing battery or you go to the uh, fire direction center or the survey section or the MET section. Sometimes uh, the, uh, not the survey, but the MET, uh, they go to a step additional school but uh using the 0844s as well um did a, a honor graduate out of fort sill uh as a private and my choice of honolulu hawaii hmm. um of course i didn't get that june so 1985 i uh reported to headquarters uh, uh battery 3rd Battalion, 10th Marines. 
station and the headquarters section there working out of the S3. So I did that for about uh, until the next year, 86. In June of 86, I, I got, because I was the honor graduate. So I ended up in Hawaii, Kaneohe Bay, at, at uh, Broadwell Marines. And out of the first amphibious uh, um, brigade, more, but uh, back then, and it was the first uh, uh, Marine Amphibious Brigade, the first MAB. 112 was the artillery battalion for the MAB. And I worked uh, out of, from 1986 until I left there to go to I go drill instructor school from there. So it, it, it was, the, I want to say, 93. I ended up leaving Hawaii. So almost six years in Hawaii, uh, did uh, the Gulf War and two other UDPs to Okinawa. So it's hardly a, uh, a lot of, lot of, lot of things going on again now. So I've been in to Hawaii or a year and a half now. I'm moving on to uh, with my you know first combat tour. Um, show up there to be years. Um, I do four platoons as a, the, uh, and then uh, three, three platoons as a senior drill instructor as a sergeant. And then my last one was as a staff. I got to do my last one as a staff sergeant. And then from San Diego to, uh, I think it was from there, I went to Camp Pendle, Las Flores with Tango 511. Um, Tango 511. I pick up an operations chief billet. Uh, um, I'm also the, you know, whatever additional billets the artillery battery has. I do that for four years. I do three deployments out of there with the with the Muse. I think four, uh, one with Fifth Marines and some. I can't remember who the one three or 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 three one. Excuse me. But I can't remember who it was or the, the, they are actually deployments on the ship. And I left in, in I want to say 97, early 97, I picked up, um, went to Fort Sill to become an instructor, the gunnery instructor at the, uh, where we taught uh, automated and manual gunnery for artillery and in operations chief and then to foreign students as well. So that was a good gig. Um, 2001, you know, September 11th was uh, I was stationed there when that me was, you know, you could see the buildup and happening and you, you, you kind of get, get an idea of what was the drums were beating slowly, but they were beating steady just like they are right, right now. Right? The modern war, we got it anyways, whether we wanted it or not. It's forced upon us. Here we are thinking we're doing the right thing as, as patriots and uh, going to other land. To... So we went to uh, from Fort Sill Department. I got selected for first sergeant. And my first ability as a first sergeant was a first battalion in fourth Marines over at uh, Zorro. I can't remember now. Anyways, uh, it came up. Um, what I showed up there in the summer of 02, 05, and I left in January 06 after being over in the 1st Marine Regiment, of course, for the last six months of that tour. Um, so I did a little bounce. OIF 1 is first starting for Bravo 1 4. OIF 2. Two others, one four, where, where we had a lot of, uh, I can, um, where we had a lot of, a uh, lot of action still going on. Of course, you, you focused on was the OIF two portion of it more than the OIF one. After OI, after I left the uh, first Marines, you know, after the, you never know where you're going to go as a 
I get selected for Sergeant Major and recruiting station. I ended up recruiting station in Los Angeles, where I did three years out of there. <clears throat> it was one of the largest recruiting stations in the country. I think Orange was probably just. And then um, recruiting station in Los Angeles moved on to 12th Marine Corps District years. So I made six years straight from uh, in Southern California, which was a battleground. But as a district, at least I got to travel because there was, uh, you know, Hawaii, you've had uh, Orange, had Alaska and Hawaii, and Washington, and all the way down, uh, all the way down. So we a lot at the district. Um, you you had sergeant majors in each recruiting station. That's where, you know, as as a sergeant major in charge of other sergeant majors. Charge, but you 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 monitor and make sure everything's going the way it's supposed to be going. Recruiting duty. I then moved to here in Yuma, Arizona, where I retired um, station because I did not not get a uh, a geo billet, so I couldn't go past thirty. I'm about to go get a government job didn't feel like work even trying to get an SES hired out of here and, and see where the cards would go I ended up uh, and that was my injury of 2015 I had a retirement out of here um, and very well treated very well by the by the 13th um, mag 13 out here. The, we, we, we did a lot, a lot of uh, first along the way if stood up the first um, one twenty one, the Green Knights. That was uh, a lot going on here. Try to help uh, quality of life improvements here on the base. Even though I'm major, the uh, majority of the Marines on the base were under the the mag, so might as well listen to what's being said. I don't. Know, that's so. That's my kind of. Uh, that's my synopsis. Of it, uh, you know, it's a it's a brief overview at forty thousand foot view, but all the the primary billets takes you special. Um, I've got three combat tours in there. Uh, obviously, Desert Storm, all F one, and, um, and you can count recruiting station Los Angeles in there too, if you want. As another kind of like, um, but there was good people there. And the, the, the career recruiters of, of, of the Marines, and I appreciate uh, some really, really stand up people there. All right, so I, I don't want to, I mean, we kind of, you just kind of blew through that whole career. How many years total was that? Well, that was 30. That was 30, 30, years? 30 years, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, let's, was, let's go back. Uh, Let's go back to Desert Storm because you kind of glossed over all, all your combat deployments. Um, can you just tell us a, a lot about – just go back to Desert Storm and, and tell us how that was because, I mean, that experience had to be completely different than, uh, you know, what we experienced in OIF-1. Oh, yeah, it, it is. And now I want to read something this or, for the audience. Um, and this is from, from the Sergeant Major of the things from his journal of – Desert Shield, Desert Storm. This is just a certain major daily calendar, but from it, I want to put his opening statement on the cover page on the letterhead from um, Lieutenant Stoddard back at the day uh, um, when he was back in Bravo uh, 112. S capture the daily events of the battalion from embarkation to our equipment to our arrival and its return. These events, as seen through my perspective, may not reflect, but may strike a note that it will recall events you may, you may remember. Each just a little bit different from those who fought right next to you. This journal is about a war that was much bigger than we all imagined. From midnights at noon, to oil and soccer in the sand, to our movement back from Camp 15 to our return, making 
sandblasting, fear and fun. What a place. It's been my great, great pleasure and honor to one of you in this battalion. I thought that was a good opening uh, way to what combat uh, experience, in, in my perspective, is it's different for if we were standing right next to each other. What, what happens to you doesn't necessarily happen to me, vice versa. Um, and and I can I can give a, a real quick example. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit first, but um, I was um, in first battalion, uh, Bravo Bravo Battery First Battalion, Twelfth Marines. Um, I believe we were on UDP UDP in Okinawa, so we got on ship. And then floated over to Saudi, uh, to Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the, and the engineering areas were. Um, of course, this is, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. And it's so that this deployment was over nearly a year long, even though the combat and it was probably uh, about mm, maybe 100 days, 120 days in transit or doing something on our way to Okinawa. So it was a long deployment as far as uh, the uh, combat battalion. Uh, we had M1 9 or 8s, uh, 155s. Uh, to, uh, the equipment back then, we had the Humvees. Humvees came out, <coughs> excuse me, 85, 86, but by that time, you know, they were pretty reliable. modified them so we could put a um, a, a, we, uh, a box for the back of the Humvee so we can install angers and radios, battery computer systems, or backup computer systems. Everything ran out of there. Uh, that, that way we could up and run at night and do 24 hour ops. You know, on, on the road, we tried back and had the backup computer systems in the cab so that way if a fire mission was called, we could stop to do if a mission was called and we'd go from there but the experience in was it, it was hellish you know in a lot of ways I mean, by the time that the uh, armor and the grunts and this is where somewhere like gunny Morales, he was a tracker i think he was a lance corporal in gulf war um but he uh going through this this land Escape. And what was going on is you had the Republican Guard who were gases. I mean, they're, they weren't nothing to mess around with, but they, had, they just didn't have the right equipment. They had the, the spirit they just, um, or the technology. But the, uh, the, they were blowing oil wells. And you can go back and look at films. And, and these oil wells burn time, some of them up to, you know, four or five months. But uh, we did that about three days to push them out. And uh, good points of contact for you, Brett. Uh, you may want the cap, cap my, my commander at the time was Captain Singleton, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I'm not sure, or Colonel. Um, I stay in touch with him every once in a while on Facebook. But he's a wealth of knowledge on Desert Storm when it comes to the battery operations. For someone major in a battery, uh, Artillery operations, it, they would be very uh, enlightened. Someone like like him, it it was it was a, a, a hellish experience. But yet we esprit de corps and just basic good solid leadership. At all of us. I mean, every unit does right. They get tested. Um, but I think we came there through there with a clean conscience and, and what we had to do. We didn't too much excess, but the problem was once we stopped firing after those three days, we stayed in play. The battery didn't move, and unfortunately, it, it was right in the middle of all these burning oil wells. He's, that's where he talks about the oil rain and the in the plant in the sand and all that. Um, and not very healthy, and, and I think there's a just like the unit. I think there's something in the Future there because there's 
a lot of uh, folks coming down 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 the road, and I can imagine why. I mean, it was it was hellish burning. Uh, burning felt like midnight at noon uh, on some days when it rained. It was, it was the dirt. It was it was sooty. You slept in it. You slept on the ground. It was on your clothes. It was in your food. You know that, that kind of deal. So that was the experience. And when we finally did get out of there, I was very happy. Um, and then again, and from there, I ended up doing DI to uh, my tour in Bravo. One, and I've got some. Uh, I don't have very many notes from from uh, Desert Storm. I've gotten some notes from December 20th, 1990 through January 81. Movement to line of departure. They're not very detailed in the sense that it talks about how we prepared and went through that and how we get to the get get to point A to point B and stuff like that. I didn't take as good a notes from the life one and I can probably walk Walk you through that's that would be a, a whole, whole another to uh, walk you through the phases of, of OIF one and and but the time went through <clears throat> and OIF two is an entirely different uh, same characters for the most part but entirely different situation from uh, OIF one again a brand new first sergeant going in. 2002 to Bravo Company 14. Uh, brand new, run things anyways. I was a drill instructor. I was a you know senior staff at the uh, detachment already. So you, you kind of you knew how to move troops. You, you, you knew how to be without breaking something, and you knew how to take, take care of inventory because that was another in the, in the notes I've got. I've got the entire CMR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can we? So the well, first four of us, I'm just going to pull this picture up. Uh, but this is this is you with the company commander. That yeah, what, what going over there? Things, yeah, yeah. We, as we started prepping, way as I start showed up there, I started asking around, and Joe, Joe Morales was there already. Um, like, um, it, 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 it was good. It was you know it's, that you can. Try trust and you don't have to worry about that's Joe Morales and uh, he was living in Orange County I met him up in Orange County I think I uh, was <clears throat> like I said I was coming out of uh, Tangle Battery so I, I, I was moving back to California to get in a place getting set up because I had orders and I met him so we had a, we had a, a burger and a beer and Sat down, talked about this and that, the landscape ahead. That hey, you know, we've only got one marine right now with any combat experience. So it was just me and Joe Morales, an entire company, and this is in, in, including the rest of the division. Where combat experience between Desert Storm and you had, you had some things going on, but it wasn't nothing like uh, like what you. I mean, uh, which was a, a total ramp up with the division went out, which is, uh, you know, the whole first Marine division as a heading out to uh, create chaos. He doesn't thought, but, but when uh, I met uh, Captain Gomez, uh, realized that uh, it's not an exaggeration. When we got our first dump from S. The company was not fully manned. Let's put it that way back in June. And then the battalion ended up getting the classes dumped into it. Think about this. So all privates, PFCs, Lance Corporals, straight into an infantry battalion, prepping to get on ship to go to an invasion. Not just in you know, Kuwait, right, where they the Iraqis invaded a small country, and we were just you know, this, this was we were going all the way to the Syrian borders. You know, we, we were we were going the Iran border. We were going to you, you, we're going 360 on, um, but we were trying to do it with, with as least damage as possible, which, which 
dogs got to feed. And unfortunately, they did. They, uh, they were scared. Yeah. But I think in the end, the way we did our training and the company formed and the companies were formed, I think it gave <clears throat> the senior leadership a lot of to train how we wanted to and how we needed to, how we saw fit. And that's why you saw so much conditioning drills, so so much communication drill, squads had a, you know, getting because because your squad leaders were corporals and lance corporals that happened to show up before you did, which is basically true. Um, and, but by the time we got on ship, and the it was phenomenal. And you show that picture from ship. Uh, that was my camera, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I, I was one of the only few that took a digital camera. I was given it as a gift. A lovely lady, she gave it to me and uh, really paid off because I took a lot of pictures. I took them in, in uh, fire team and squad size, um, quarterman or by weapons to section. Uh, um, and that way it gave us some feedback going on. You see the patch on my arm? That's from the, even though I, I had taken as a kid, it shows you how devious these people are, right? They made us take the small pot we were on ship, all of us. You remember how sick people got? That was, they should have never did that. That was unnecessary. And especially they, they because here I am, the first started telling you, you got to do it. I ended up having to do it. So I, I didn't, but I did it anyways. And that was back in 2001. I didn't take the vaccine in 22. By that time, I figured out that I don't need to. You're not going to coerce me. I don't, I don't um, you know, so I didn't do it. And fortunately for it paid off, I, I lost two sisters to the vaccine already. Um, one, one within hours. So just wilted away. So I have a. Uh, hey, real quick, Arch. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this will help, but if you can try to pull that phone closer to you, because uh, I know the audio feed is really. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind it of distorted. Here. So I know a lot of people are having issues with uh, hearing. <clears throat> okay, how's that? Uh, my, it might be better. Okay. Anyway, so um, that picture from us on ship, we ended up uh, holding all the way, all the way over. And, uh, oh, man, where did we get off? I, I sent you a couple pictures in the email, of, uh, things like this. It, uh, uh, it's, this is my daily log, log from April May 03. Uh, during the offload Thomas Guide, in which I can go through that, that as well, which was some interesting stories. And uh, from March 31st to 12 September 03, uh, to September 12th, uh, when we started to backload. So, a range of of uh, documentation going on. Of course, there's other ways. I think other platoon commanders had some documentation. And there was, of course, the logs. I don't know who else. Uh, you saw the film from the, he had a good, uh, uh, the, the severe clear. He had, uh, he took video. I wish I had a video camera. I didn't. I just had that small digital camera. I'd be careful, very creatures. <laughs> so I yeah, so I, I learned I my. Uh, I took a camera with me on uh, to my third deployment in uh, to Afghanistan, uh, just because I, you know, by the time I went to Afghanistan in 2010, 2011 time frame, you know, I had the experience of the two Iraq deployments where all I had was you know a wind up camera, <laughs> so I was like, yeah. man. I, I would I'd give a left nut to uh, have some video from, from those deployments. And uh, so I had this little tiny flip camera thing that I took with me to Afghanistan and just, you know, having those memories is just fantastic. Well, yeah, that desert storm was, I, you know, I had this same thing, the, the little wind up camera where you get 12, 12, or maybe if you bought a big roll of 24 pictures, uh, but then you got to go get them developed and you got to protect it. So yeah, I've got a lot of those. Uh, but, you know, I was thankful 
grateful that I had that digital stuff on ship. I was able to take a lot of cam pictures because I was able to download them onto some of them. And then, uh, so I went into the actual, uh, you know, operations. I, I took what I could, but I couldn't take that many. I mean, it's just, we're just moving to sometimes. That one picture you showed at the very beginning was in April. I think it was April. 2003, um, when we crossed the the, all, the day before, in the tracks, we swam across, and then uh, we hit that Air Force, and then and, uh, we crossed, crossed the bridge. Second platoon did a, a play, and then uh, we ended up having to stay at this intersection. This is where this is that area right there. Hassan Al-Hamsa is, is the name of the city or the town uh, into the lower Baghdad, southern Baghdad, more or less. And then we started, you probably remember that because you cleared that entire block, block area after yeah. uh, after uh, uh, Corporal Garza yeah, that was a whole other thing. Saddam City. Yeah, and again, well, yeah, that was that was right there at that intersection where we're into. To, I mean, I can show you the exact spot on Tom's Um because when we um, Corman up, up, man down, was with the XO, we had just and we ended up take, taking the XO's track with. Buddy Morales jumped in and I jumped and ran over there and we were the first track. And of course, they put out security and, and uh, it, it was it was already done. I mean, I don't I don't think he suffered at all. Just unfortunately, before he hit the ground. So, but it was uh, it was tough being you know the stand up guy. These guys were. Yeah, so that, but, but I, um, the offload and, and you know, and the, the logs all the way through, throughout uh, that deployment, I didn't, uh, I didn't do much in OIF2 like I did in OIF1 because it was a lot different. I just had to keep track of people coming in and out of the battalion as far as the uh, headquarters and then tracking casualties in and out of the fob and helping the estuary and I could, you know, running water, running logistics. Um, when the, when the Huey went, went down in the cemetery, right, right that started uh, the, the real hornet's nest. That's when the hornet's nest got kicked. It was getting poked two weeks before that, but when the helo got shot, I was at the fob with, uh, the cat, Lieutenant Borio on the on the radio, bringing the pilots in. I think it was Captain Mount, and I was there when they they dropped him out of the vehicle. They brought him out, there, and the battalion doc was right there with him. Uh, we're still in the dirt, right by the Texas barrier. And they're just doing uh, he's doing initial aid. The uh, battalion aid station is still about yards down, and then, uh, but I remember. Captain Mount, because I remember his name, because he and he had been shot. It looked like from uh, from AK or thirty. Oh, the left eye through the sinus, and so his right eye was swollen shut, and it probably I think he lost it, but conscious, and he was he was working through the whole thing, even though he just crash landed a Huey. So that was kind of an interesting thing. That was the beginning of that fight, um, which of course, of course started off the what you, you guys have been covering the 18th anniversary of the Battle of Najaf. You know, I, I goes all goes. There's a lot of moving pieces in that. Believe me, there's a lot, <laughs> lot of moving. Yeah, right. I have no doubt. 
Ward, I, I don't know what to say because uh, the the mic the mic issue has been uh, cutting in and out, and I think it's it's degrading our uh, our our story here. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize for that. I I thought, thought I had a uh, I've got a microphone that's downstairs. I was going to put it on here so I could put the earpiece in and speak through that. that. But let me go. Let me go try that real quick. Okay, I'm gonna go grab it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the mic. You can, you can still talk, talk away. All right. Well, while he's while he's doing that, guys, and uh, I, I apologize. Um, you know, we when I was trying to set this up with him, we were having issues, and uh, obviously, not everybody has the same type of a uh, computer equipment. So, uh, the only way we could try to make this work was him using his video on his computer and then talking on his uh, cell phone. Um, so the, believe it or not, the audio from his computer was a little bit worse. <laughs> so, uh, we thought this was going to be a good Koa. Um, okay. okay. How's that sound? Uh, that might be good. Okay. Yeah. I just put in the, uh, the, the earpiece and it worked better. All right. So, yeah, uh, be where we leave off that? Okay. Ask away. Oh, that's so, so much better. I wish you had, had that from the get-go. There's no telling how many people sorry. left because of yeah. audio issues. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, so I, I want to I backtrack. I know you jumped ahead to OIF2, but I think we just kind of glossed over OIF1. There's there's so much that's not known about that just because the you know the Iraq war lasted so long. And um, right. you know people kind of forget about the invasion. And Can you just speak to the experience of being a first sergeant? I've had the the privilege as a as a sergeant major now. You know, I've had the pr pr uh, privilege of being a company first sergeant in an infantry rifle company. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces, even in, back in the rear. So I can only imagine going into, an, you know, something like an invasion where you're just constantly on the move. You're operating out of the back of an AEV, uh, just the keeping your, you know, keeping accountability of all the personnel, all the moving parts uh, in the middle of a, a invasion and then yeah. having to deal with, you know, things like, unfortunately, casualties. I mean, can you speak to that? Because I mean, that's that's an interesting perspective that I think that you would have. That ninety nine percent of the other service members that have gone down range and served in combat wouldn't have wouldn't have experienced. Yeah, I mean, we we hit on it earlier when we had a conversation about. You know, I asked you how old you were, and, um, and I I I told you to put it in perspective. Now, when I crossed the line of departure. On OIF one, I was forty-one years old. I'd already been a Marine eighteen years, you know, um, at this point. And again, the only other person with any combat experience at that time was even none of the officers had any. Uh, um, they were willing. We had a lot of willing. So the experience. So there was a lot of fear of the unknown and trying to tell people, you know, teach. Uh, through training, repetition, confidence in their skills and their weapons and the people next. We can do this, but we got to do it together. Um, so, Steve, um, I don't know who that is. Um, sorry, I just saw it. Um, but uh, it was, uh, uh, for me, experience, as you can imagine, just as much as it is as it's not like I had everything figured out. Try, you know, I, I know all the pieces that go in place. I'm playing it day by day, trying to get liable intel as possible and not trust on the rumor mill because that's never reliable. And went back and tried to translate the, the experience into something that that you as a, as a new PFC, Lance Coble, as a new or your first, for six months in Marine Corps, and we're, we're sending you to war, buddy. You know, <laughs> the daddy of fear, and that's, that's what the, the veterans and the staff NCOs were there for, and the NCOs instill that confidence to conquer the fear. Um, you know, a lot of man's luck will hold as long as his courage holds. Uh, um, yeah, yeah you know, and if I all, can just jump in. 
Uh, that and that was uh, one of the issues I think we had is our our leadership was so, so junior, right? Because my my squad leader was a Lance Corporal, and you know their right. their experience before that was just a regular, you know, on ship. Um, I think they deployed off the coast, uh, you know, in support of OEF, but they never they never went in, and uh, they they didn't have any combat experience, and they were very junior. And, uh, you know, during the invasion, they were still playing, you know, boot fuck, 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 fuck games with the junior Marines, um, which you just can't do in combat. And, uh, right. I think like, that- he, yeah, but you, you have to understand they didn't know anybody. They didn't, you know, they're only right. doing what they were taught at that up to that point. Right. Because they're, they went to why, which is nothing but fuck, fuck games. You want to, you want to talk it that way. Um, it, it is, it, it's, it's, a, it's and once they get out of that process, that's why they rely on the NCOs at the level to instill that confidence and, and proper leadership, right? That's why we have those things to, 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 to as, as a guide direction we want you to go instead of playing these, yeah. Hindsight is, it is. Yeah, I remember um, the, a few yeah. the few NCOs we did have in weapons platoon were were solid NCOs, and I remember the you know in the rifle platoons the NCOs that we had were solid. It was just uh, you know those you know quote senior lance corporals. <laughs> <laughs> those those were the vast majority of them were the ones that were uh, you know ill ill prepared. I would say. Believe me, uh, um, one one of the things I have is a daily log from uh, April thirty to. May 28th, but I, I also have the complete alpha roster, four plus attachments from February 20th all the way to September 9th. That was attachment or attachment. But yeah, and it goes on. I mean, the original roster, uh, February 20th of 03, and I've got so many things for data rank, detach. Um, Everything all the way through the company, and, and I'll, I'll I'll name off a few names of weapons company. You probably back to you, like Albright or Ali, Andrews, Begay, Beltran, Bonilla, Bruce, a couple Borneo, uh. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Uh, Cap. Uh, Some of these names you probably haven't heard in a while, have you? Oh, a lot. Of, actually, a lot of those guys I still talk to. There's, there's a few oh, that good. you know dropped off the radar. Well, here's some more. You want me to go just one platoon? But a lot of those guys <laughs> out there are saying, you know, hey man, I. I lost touch with. So that's the thing. That's why um, this is useful for me because I've had, my memories. You know, I'm six quite as sharp, sharp as it used to be, even though I try to stay mentally sharp. But you know, it's just like like a computer. Your your brain ends up dumping useless stuff, and after you forget the things that, that uh, you don't recall all often. You know, you don't go back and look at. It. Now, some of these names are. That's why they bring back memories, but their names I haven't heard. In a while. That, that, and that's pretty cool. Um, I mean, like we talked about our time, because there wasn't, wasn't very many. Um, back in February of Oaker, out of third platoon, Staff Sergeant Bell, TAD to Kuwait, in advance of the battalion. Staff Sergeant, I mean, Staff Sergeant Chavez, Staff Sergeant Collins at the time, Second Lieutenant. Here's uh, Corporal Curtis, who was uh, February 1st. So you kind of get the idea that there's not a lot of NCOs on this list when we first started. They're all PFCs, like I said, five straight classes. Classes out of SOI got dumped into our battalion. 
which will work. So you talk, talk about out of each class, there's probably a hundred, about a hundred and what, something like that, if not more, because they got divided up between uh, fifth Marines and seventh Marines. But we had uh, you know, five classes come in straight to our battalion and didn't get spread out the rest of the, the rest of the regiment. And they, came, they all came to us. So that's how, how under strength we were. And I know first Marine regiment was set up at the time I'm in uh, discussing it was uh, you have the first Marine regiment with the first battalion, first Marines and Marines, and then the third battalion, first Marines. And you wonder, well, how does Marine fit underneath the first Marines? We have to go back to Marine Corps history and understand the fourth to have lost its regimental colors. Uh, in combat overseas, and those colors, so they take three, three infantry battalions out of the Fourth Marines, and they divide them various regiments in the First Marine or the First Division. So, First Marines two four is over in, I believe, Fifth Marines and ninth, Seventh Marines. If that, if I may be not not accurate on that, but I'm pretty sure that's how it. And so that each infantry battalion had four infantry companies plus a one. So that was the breakdown. And in each weapons company, like I said, I've got the uh, as well, which I, I thought was pretty pretty funny to have that. So, so Sergeant Major Archibald, um, in the future, we're going to have to redo this. Um, is unfortunately the, okay. the com view is just it's jacked with this stream okay. the whole time. Um, but just to, um, and I, again, I wish it can go longer, but I, um, I don't think the audio is good enough for for the vast majority of the folks watching. Um, That's fine. Um, like I said, I'm retired. Man, so. it's in the Marine Corps. What would you say to a young man that's thinking about joining the Marine Corps? Um, just give him 30 years uh, um, of experience. Well, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm all about recruiting. I spent six years on recruiting, and I understand the the troubles and trips. I would say do your research. Join for the right reasons. Um, that's probably not which a good career if you're looking for something more, um something that's missing within you there's challenges so there's rewards but there's also a price to pay so and make, make your own decisions all right guys well we're going to wrap it up unfortunately uh i wish we could go longer uh we've just been plagued by bad calm issues all night and uh i think it takes away from the sergeant major's uh, narrative here so uh, i think what we'll do is we'll recock and uh try to figure this out and hopefully we can re refilm this interview in the future so those of you that stuck around i do appreciate everybody uh jumping in here tonight i know we had about 30 or so folks watching um sergeant major archibald you got any final words before we uh close this out no i appreciate the time and I'm, i apologize Apologize for the uh, um, technical difficulties to anybody that, and I appreciate it if you were um, and you were interested. Uh, again, I can uh, Facebook look at and my first name Lawrence Archambault. There's uh, uh, also getter under L underscore E underscore Latin. Um, always on there for you know information all right guys well like i said we're gonna we're gonna try to figure this out and uh hopefully we can do this redo this interview uh in the future so appreciate everybody jumping on tonight everybody have a good night <laughs>